All right. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Energy Institute's Improving Your Safety Culture Using the Hearts and Minds Toolkit webinar. Uh, my name is Fahmida, and I am the Senior Training Officer here at the Energy Institute. So I'll be at hand throughout the um, webinar in the background if you need anything. And so just drop me a message on the chat and I'll be able to support you if you have any issues. Um, I'll start off with just introducing who we are. So the NG Institute is a professional membership body for those who work within the sector and across who have an interest in energy. Our aim is to provide the energy industry with cost effective value adding knowledge on key current and future issues. Uh, we produce guidance documents, knowledge resources, events and training opportunities for our members. Um, so this webinar will introduce you to the Hearts and Minds Toolkit itself and will also introduce you to the Hearts and Minds training course that we run. Um, I'll let Matthew touch on that a little bit later on. Um, I'll quickly run through some house rules. Um, so if everyone could please stay muted throughout the session, that would be great. Um, and if you could keep your cameras off, that would also be great just to reduce any distraction. Uh, there will be a chance um, for you to ask any questions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. So save your questions till then if you prefer to say them out loud or just if you think you're going to forget, just drop them in the chat box and we can go through them at the end as well. So as and when you feel, just drop the questions in the chat box. Just to let everyone know, the session will be recorded, so you'll be able to watch it later on if you miss anything. Um, and I think that's it for me, to be honest. Um, I will pass you on to Matthew um, to introduce himself. And we'll share the slides um, with the participants, won't we, for media? Yeah, yeah, we will. Yeah. OK, OK, great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself and then, uh, as for me to said, I'll give you some background to the Hearts and Minds programme, then just an overview of the Hearts and Minds toolkit and then uh, some information about the training course that's due to take place in May this year. Uh, I hope to be done by 10.45, so that'll give us 15 minutes in the hour for um, Q&A at the end. And I've got some polls through the webinar as well to keep it, you know, to keep, um, keep you engaged, I hope. OK, so just a bit about myself and my experience. Uh, I started off, I've been working in this area for about 20 years, a bit longer now. I started off at the University of Manchester as a postgrad and then a postdoc. Um, I was working on a research project that was funded by Shell, which started, you know, started the work which led into creating the Hearts and Minds Toolkit. So it was the Hearts and Minds Research Programme. I worked with BP for many years. Um, I've also been partnering with the Energy Institute for over 10 years, uh, mainly doing uh, delivering that tr the training course that I'll talk about later. I've worked with lots of different companies and lots of different industries, um, and it's always about um, helping companies that want to improve their safety culture. So understand it, assess it, and um, you know take action to improve their safety culture. So that's what I work with. Um, you know, that's how I work with companies. Uh, I'm also a chartered psychologist uh, in the British Psychological Society. OK, so some more background. So what is Hearts and Minds? Some of you may well be familiar with this, um, but it was originally developed by Shell in the early 2000s, and there's been ongoing work since then to you know carry on that work. It's it was originally de designed as a toolkit, so to help people in organizations like yourselves to improve their safety culture. And these tools, these uh, you know, ways of uh, working on different aspects of safety culture, uh, they're based on research that was conduct conducted at several universities, including Manchester in the UK, Leiden in the Netherlands, uh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, they're both in Scotland, obviously, and some other universities in, uh, in the UK. The toolkit is managed by the Energy Institute, but it still belongs to Shell and Sh Shell still uses it uh, in their operations. But what happened was uh, when Shell was using the tools uh, with their contractors and suppliers, lots of those companies said, can we use the tools as well? And they were overwhelmed by requests for materials and help and, um, you know, sort of getting hold of the, the materials, the actual tools. So they passed on the toolkit to the Energy Institute to manage and distribute to 
all these companies that were interested in using them as well. So it's been available to use um, in any organization since uh, 2004. Some of the uh, recent uh, and current research projects that um, some PhDs have looked at and with other types of research work are safety leadership, learning from incidents, high reliability organizations and how that relates to leadership. And the latest research PhD Aberdeen University is looking at confirmation bias and risk normalization. So there's ongoing research that's funded by the Hearts and Minds program as well. OK, so what's the role of the Energy Institute? I'll just cover that quickly. So it's the public face of Hearts and Minds, and that's the website, which I'll repeat on a few slides, actually, the, the website address. Um, and as I said, it manages the Hearts and Minds toolkit on behalf of Shell, who's still the owner. So it publishes the toolkit. That means it makes the tools available. It uh, provides supporting materials and resources through the website. And there's lots and lots of good information uh, on the website, uh, both you know about the tools and um, uh, about the tools and about those supporting materials and the background and lots of research. Um, there is uh, the training course that I'll talk about later. And um, we have a number of trainers who can deliver that. That's Diane Parker, who's my colleague from the University of Manchester. Um, and we've delivered the training many times together. The Energy Institute also uh, updates and uh, adapts and refreshes existing tools. So that's one of the tools that's been refreshed in the last few years, the Understanding Your Culture tool. And it also, continues to fund that university research, like I said, at the PhD at Aberdeen, which leads to new tools or additions to tools or uh, updates and ref uh, refresh, you know, refreshing of the existing tools. So it's an ongoing program. Uh, you know, it's been around for 20 years, but that work continues to continually adapt and improve the tools and keep them up to date. OK, so some of the key features of the tools um, which people have uh, actually mentioned to us as well. So we know we know about them. People say we like the tools because of these things. Um, many people say that they like the fact that each tool is based on academic research. So the idea that Shell had was to look at all the, you know, learning from psychology and sociology and identify what are the things that will help us. So you could do, you know, you could do a whole PhD or a whole research career on looking at what psychology might tell you to improve safety culture in your organization. But, um, you know, what they wanted was uh, a team to identify the sort of the, the nuggets, the key learnings and bring them into, make them into something practical and useful that people could use in organizations. So they're people who worked for Shell. So each tool ha generally has a workshop with interactive exercises. Uh, they're designed to be delivered by non-experts, so you don't have to bring people in to run the workshops to use the tools. Uh, people do like a bit of help starting off. That's what the training course is for. Um, there's a range of tools and technique techniques to improve safety culture, so you don't have to use all the tools in the toolkit. You choose the ones which are applicable to you know your situation, the things that you want to improve in culture in your organization. So it's not a training program. The actual toolkit, it is a toolkit and different tools do different jobs. So there's one that looks at making compliance easier, for example. That's a specific thing that you might want to work on. If you didn't want to work on that in your organization, you wouldn't have to use that tool. And another idea is that people identify their problems. They identify where they want to improve and then the workshops help them identify and create uh, solutions and ways to take action to improve in those areas. So it's very engaging and it's about getting people in involved to think about how they're going to generate their their, you know, their ideas and implement those ideas in terms of improving safety culture. Some of the tools are available in several languages. Um, that varies across the tools, given you know whether they've been updated recently or how much they've been used. And some tools are available in more languages than others, depending on how old, you know how much they've been used. Okay. 
So who's used the Hearts and Minds Toolkit? Well, several hundred companies worldwide have used the Hearts and Minds tools over the last, um, you know, 20 years and, you know, companies continue to use them. Uh, there's some, you know, logos that you'll recognize of uh, companies that have been that have used them in the past. Uh, some of those are still using them, for example, Shell, Vattenfall, Petronas particularly. Um, and what you'll see is that this is a wide, you know, this covers a wide range of industries. So they haven't just been used in oil and gas, they've been used in other industries as well. For example, I just recently um, spent a couple of days with a company that supplies broadband to rural parts, so places in the country in the UK. And they were interested in the Hearts and Minds tools and how they might use them. And you can imagine that's a very, very different risk profile to an oil and gas operation. But they said, you know, these are still applicable. These are still, you know, relevant to us in terms of how people think about safety, how they think about risk, how they, um, you know, use procedures. They said all these things are, are still applicable. And it's because you've always got people in organisations. And what the Hearts and Minds tools do is help you with those people related aspects of how an organization operates. OK. So just a you've probably seen this diagram before, uh, and this is originally from Shell and they call it the three curves of organizational safety. This is how the Hearts and Minds tools fit into other things that all organizations will do to ensure their safety and to improve um, their safety performance. So what Shell said was from, you know, the, from their journey, from their, you know, their history, if you like, um, they said, you know, they started looking at technology. So when they wanted to make sure their operations were safe and improve safety, what they first looked at was technology. So things like engineering, equipment, um, compliance with uh, environmental and health regulations. And they found that over time, the number of incidents came down. Then, um, and this sort of coincides with the time of um, Piper Alpha, so we're thinking sort of, you know, early 80s, they started looking at their systems. So they started, you know, and that was thing, you know, inspired by the safety case, you know, all these op all operations needed a safety case to operate in the North Sea. And within systems, they looked at things like procedures and rules, uh, certification, assurance, you know, safety management systems, auditing those systems, uh, people's competencies, risk assessment, all those things. And they found that over time, again, their number of incidents fell. Um, then what they looked at was uh, what we'd call culture. And within that, you'd find things like leadership, accountability, which is quite nebulous. You know, what really is accountability? That always inspires a debate. Attitudes and behaviours. Um, you know, and these are the intangible things that are all key to safety culture. But what they said was, you know, to really push that number of incidents down, they need to look at all three of those um, areas um, to, you know, to foster, you know, everyone's motivation for safety right across the workforce. So it's looking at all those three things. Now, companies say, do you have to do them in that order? And it's no, you're doing them all at the same time, really. Um, but what the Hearts and Minds Toolkit is aimed at is that part where you're looking at culture, those in intangible things. And more specifically, you know, relating to the um, Hearts and Minds Toolkit, some of the things that it, the tools help you with that relate to that third wave, that third curve of safety, are things like supervision skills, uh, rule breaking, uh, broken rules or non-compliance, that would be a more updated way of saying that, how people perceive risk and what they do with it, how they behave safely, safety leadership. So it's those sort of things that fall in that third category. OK, so and one final thing about the uh, background to Hearts and Minds. Um, and this is something that's been talked about, you know, for the last several years in relation to uh, safety differently or safety too, if you've heard of that. And it's the idea of um, workers imagined versus workers done, or as um, 
uh, Jop Krunovek from the Netherlands calls it the paper world versus the real world. Or that could be you know, so the, the online document world versus the real world. And this is, you know, this is just one reason why you might want to use, uh, you know, the Hearts and Minds Toolkit, one reason why you might want to improve your safety culture. Because this difference between how work actually gets done and how people think it gets done, that's part of culture. And all of the tools address this in some way because uh, they look at the people in the organization and the, how they interact with the systems in the organization. So this diagram illustrates the difference between what should be happening and what actually is happening. Um, and it sort of refers to the you know, compliance of the rules, rules and procedures and those management systems. So if you think that the um, work is imagined, this is how, you know, the management system, or this is how if you're sitting in an office, you might think that a task is being done. So it's being done according to the procedure, you know, according to the risk assessment, the permit to work, the rules, everything's being followed perfectly. And, you know, this is the way that the organisation believes work should happen according to its systems and processes. And, you know, you could think of that, think of that as perfect work. So you've got perfect workers, perfect weather, perfect tools, perfect processes. The dark blue line represents a uh, reality. So in order to get the job done, people doing the job might have to adapt the procedures or processes to get that job done so to match the, you know, the outcome of the task that they're required to do. So things may not happen exactly as they're described in the procedure. Um, so things get done differently. What happens here? So maybe you haven't got the right equipment. You've got fewer people working than is specified in the procedure. What happens is the work, you know, how work gets done drifts away from what is imagined and gets closer to the hazard. You know, your, your risk increases. So the level of risk is going up. Uh, the red line here, this shows that as the gap between the two blue lines widens, the level of risk increases. So you're increasing the likelihood of something going wrong. This gap between um, the plan, you know, how work is imagined, so the, how it's planned and how it's actually performed is it's like the gap in operations and that gives you information about the reality of safety, the reality of how things are going on. So if you know about that gap, that can help you plan better um, for the work, plan better for the next time it's done, maybe change your procedures. So the more that you know about how these things are done in reality, the better prepared you are as an organisation. Now, in most organisations, most workplaces, there is a gap between these two blue lines. And that gap may get bigger over time and bring in new risks or hazards that are not planned for, so they're not protected against. The Making Plants Easier tool is specifically designed to help you identify those gaps in your work, in your organisation. And so if you know more about that, the better you can close those gaps and work on that. And the Making Compliance Easier tool both points you towards improving compliance, but also improving procedures as well. So it takes an approach in both of those, two of those curves of safety, both improving what people do and also improving the procedure. So I'd like to try out the new uh, polls function in Teams and just ask very quickly this poll. So that should appear to you uh, on your screens. And it's just, uh, you know, in your experience, does work always take place as imagined in your organisation? So does it always take place how, you know, how it's written down, how things are written in the procedure, um, you know, how things are specified in the management system. OK, so I'm not sure. If I. I haven't used this before, <laughs> so I'm not sure if you can see the results or not. You may be able to see them in the chat, I believe. But what we've got is 
actually we've got zero percent uh, from the responses so far saying yes. Uh, we have 72 percent saying no and 28 percent it depends. If um, if you feel comfortable, you can feel free to share some of the reasons why work doesn't take place as imagined in your organization or what it depends on in the chat box. So, so it's about 70 30 now between no and it depends. So, but still nobody's saying yes. So there's always that that difference between, you know, how what's planned and what actually gets done. And some of that is due to the fact that people are enacting these procedures. People are actually implementing those things and reality sometimes gets in the way. It's not because people are, you know, want to actually not comply. So we've got one comment, resource constraints causing pressure to hit deadlines depends on the culture and what you demand, resources, priorities, attitudes. Yes, thank you. So we've got some reasons there why those things uh, happen. And this is one of the things that the Hearts and Minds Toolkit will help you with. OK, so I'll just go on to the next thing that I want to talk about. So obviously I've been talking about safety culture a lot. And so what do we mean by that? So organizational safety culture can be de defined as, and there's a, you know, if you Google that, that might be one of the definitions that come up. Um, the shared beliefs and values of people working in an organization that determine the commitment to and quality of that organization's overall safety performance. So what most people say when you ask them what's safety culture or what's culture, is they'll say it's the way we do things around here. And what I always want to add to that is and why we do them that way. So it's not only the way people do things, the way they see others doing things. So that's that shared aspect of people working. It's also almost like the stories people tell each other about why things are done that way. Oh, we can't do it that way because. You know, we can't do the job with four people because we never get four people, you know, on site. You know, there's always somebody on holiday or there's always a lack of resources, for example. So it's always important to think about both the individual behaviours, but also the group behaviours, which are accepted and reinforced in the company, in the way things get done in the workplace. And when we say, you know, the way we do things around here in terms of safety and operations, it could be things like how procedures are understood, how procedures are followed, how confident or able people feel to report safety concerns and what they think will be done with those concerns. Will they be put in a box, in a press sheet? Never, no, and does then any action get uh, taken on those concerns if they report them? How communication is around safety, you know, how those messages are received, um, is there good communication up and down the line? Is there good commu communication across different departments in the organisation? Um, people's attitude to risk, tolerance of risk, how decisions get made. That's a really important thing because people, you know, a decision gets made and people talk about it. There's always a story about how a decision gets made in an organisation. Um, who is involved in safety activities like hazard assessment, invest, uh, incident investigation, for example? How maintenance gets done. If you're talking to people about culture, if you ask them how maintenance gets done, they'll always give you a lot of information about what's prioritised in the organisation. And interestingly, people will look at how a company does its maintenance and they will uh, infer you know, the level of care that an organisation takes about their equipment. They will think, well, if a company cares to this level about their equipment and their infrastructure, it also shows how much they might care about us as well. I found that many times, which is quite an interesting um, feature of, um, you know, culture and when you talk to people about what that really means. In the Hearts and Minds Toolkit, um, there is this safety culture ladder, which I'm sure many of you have seen before and are familiar with. This is the basis of how, you know, the Hearts and Minds approach and how it looks at you know how safety culture improves as a company puts resource and effort into improving uh, their culture. So I'll just run through this briefly. 
Um, obviously, there's five levels uh, at the bottom. This is the one called pathological, and this is an organization where they don't really care about safety as long as they're not caught. So as long as they're complying with the law, they're not going to get caught by the regulator. They think they've done enough. Uh, the next level up is called reactive, and this is where the organization starts to think, oh, this safety thing is important. We need to do something about this. And we do a lot you know, every time there's an incident. So something happens and they react to that. Uh, the next level up called calculative. This is where um, a company has lots of systems in place to manage the hazards. So that this is typified by, you know, we've got our HSE management system, therefore we've solved the problem. The next level up proactive, this is where you get increasing uh, safety leadership and a company is driving towards continuous improvement. And at the top level, generative, that's like the, you know, what you, the level you'd aspire to. Um, and this is where people are saying things like, HSC is how we do business around here. The only way to do things is the safe way. And what you'll get is that you'll get better levels of uh, information flow. So you'll get better communication as you go up the ladder. And also people will have increased levels of trust and accountability as you go up the ladder. So I'll just give you some uh, examples of what you might hear being said uh, at those different levels of the ladder. So at the uh, bottom level, uh, at the pathological, this is where people say, well, the regulator said it was OK, so we can carry on working like this. People might say, I've done my bit for safety this year, so I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. Um, of course, we have incidents. It's a dangerous business. And if somebody is involved in an incident, they may even be fired, you know, because people, the organization doesn't want people like that around anymore. It's all about blame and, you know, the individual is at fault, not the organization. Then, as I said, next level up, reactive, the organization starts to think about safety and how it's important. Uh, they say, you know, People might say we're serious about safety, but why don't they do what they're told? So why don't people just follow the rules? Not thinking, is it even possible to be able to follow those procedures and rules? There might be lots of discussions to reclassify incidents. You know, can we downgrade this LTI to a TRF? You know, can we get somebody into the office working so they're not off work so we can record that incident in a different way? Um, and people say, you know, you have to understand that it's different for us. Other people, other companies can do things differently, um, but we can't do that here because of our constraints. There's less of a sense of possibility of working better. Then at calculative, as I said, this is where an organization has its HSC management in system in place. So they think they've solved everything, but then they get surprised if they have an incident. Why isn't our system working? Why aren't people following the system, the procedures, the rules? So there's lots of audits to check on those uh, systems. There's lots of statistics and information and data collected, but it's all the focus is on collecting the data, creating the data, collecting the information, not about using it to actually improve and fix things before they're a problem. Then at proactive, so that next step up. So this is, you know, where an organization still has those systems. You know, it's not, that's you're building on them. You're not getting rid of them. You're building on those systems and actually thinking, how do we make that flourish? What's our data telling us? Um, we need to make resources available to fix things based on learning from that data so that we can prevent incidents happening. So management wants the data, they want the information still, but they're open to new ideas in terms of changing the ways of working, increased resources, changing priorities, that sort of thing. What you also might get is, um, procedures being owned by the workforce. So those people doing the work, their expertise is recognized and brought into uh, the creation, the review, and then and maintaining procedures and the systems and how things actually get done. And at that top level, which some people see as an aspirational level, it's difficult to get to and difficult to stay there. But at generative, you've got this idea, you're building on those calculative and proactive levels. But, um, you know, 
in addition to those, you've got this idea of chronic unease or mindfulness where you're always thinking, what have we missed? What more can we do? How do we maintain our good performance? How do we maintain our systems? How do we learn um, from, you know, what we've been doing, learning from others to keep that level of culture at the top of the ladder? So safety is seen as good business um, and new ideas are welcomed in terms of how to stay at the top of the ladder. One thing that's come up over working with the toolkit and actually training people is they've said the way that we learn in an organization helps push you up the ladder and that would be something that would be you know might, we could talk about in the training course you know how does the how do you improve your learning process in your organization which would help you improve your culture and as i said you've got more you get better informed better trust and better accountability as you go up that ladder so I'd just like to do uh, another poll uh, and ask you, where do you think you are on that ladder in your organization? And this, you know, if you're in a large organization, just think about that part which you know well. You know, so the part of the organization that you're familiar with. And it might be difficult to choose one level, but if you, you know, if that is the case, then you know you might want to think about where am I or where are we when we're under pressure? So if we have to meet a target or a deadline, does that have an impact on how we do things and where we find ourselves on that culture ladder? So just looking at the responses, we've got 21% uh, at reactive and Uh, Thirty-eight percent calculative and thirty-five are proactive. So quite a range there, and typically, you know, that's what you'll typically get with, um, you know, when you ask people this. Uh, you, you know, people might say, well, actually, sometimes we're calculative, sometimes we're proactive in some areas, but if something, if we're under pressure, we might slip down to reactive, or you might find that they are you're at different levels of the ladder um in different departments or for different activities in your organization so it's not always we're at one level across the entire organization all the time if you want to know more uh if you want to get into the ladder a bit more there is a youtube video available on the hearts and minds website i've put the link in there it'll be on the slides so you will get it um after this session okay so I'll just go on to the Hearts and Minds Toolkit just for, you know, just give you an overview. And, you know, this is what some of the tools look like. As I said, there's more information on the Hearts and Minds website and it's the Energy Institute that manages and publishes the toolkit. So what's the overall aim of the toolkit? Uh, so the tools address, you know, the main challenges in improving safety culture. And this sort of originated from the Shell request back uh, in the early 2000s. They wanted, you know, the, the nuggets of information from psychology and sociology to help them improve safety culture. And these were the areas that they they thought of, you know, in, in those first five years when they were thinking about set, putting this together. So understanding your culture and preparing for change, uh, learning from incidents, improving practices and procedures, improving supervision and leadership, and understanding managing and managing hazards and risks. So they're the areas, they're actually the sections from the Hearts and Minds website. And there are, you know, tools for each of those sections that you'll find on the website. Also, um, uh, Stuart King is the contact from the Energy Institute uh, about the Hearts and Minds tools. So if there's anything about the website or the tools themselves, then uh, he's the person you can contact. So what's in the Hearts and Minds Toolkit? It consists of 10 tools uh, listed here. I won't go into these uh, now, but um, there's more information on the website. On the website, you'll also see there's lots and lots of support resources. So in addition to the tools, there's lots of material that helps you use the tools in your situation, in your companies, in your organizations. For example, uh, facilitating materials like flip charts, 
uh, presentations that help you run the workshop from the tools. There are papers and articles, uh, blog pieces, videos, case studies, lots of different things that will help you use the tools as well. The ones that we look at in the training usually are understanding your culture, making change last, uh, managing rule breaking, sorry, that's say making compliance easier is what it's called now, and improving supervision. There may be time to look at a few of the other tools as well, depending on, you know, how the training course progresses over, you know, and how much time is available. An example of one of the tools, um, this is the understanding your culture tool and how that helps you improve your culture is that it helps you look at different uh, dimensions of an organization. So these organizational characteristics and for each one, it's got a description of what that looks like at each of the levels of the ladder. So it helps you think about, well, you know, a, a variety of different uh, things that uh, will be happening in your organization, how maintenance gets done, how HSC is communicated, how leaders show care for the workforce, for example, and it gives you a workshop to identify where people think they are on the ladder for those different things, deciding which ones are the most important to them at the time, and then giving them the space to think about how would we improve in some of those key areas. But obviously there would be more information about that workshop in the training. That's just one of the tools that we use. Uh, we you know, help people get started with in the training course. OK. So just for the last five minutes, I'll um, give you an overview of the training course uh, that we provide. And as I said, we put this training course together some years ago now, and it was because the Energy Institute kept getting requests from people uh, like yourselves, working in organisations saying, we really like the Hearts and Minds tools, we like the toolkit, we like the approach, but we want a bit of help getting started. We want to be shown, you know, what the tool's for, how do we use them, a bit of practice in using them, what are the workshops about, and you know, help us get started with the using the tools in our organization. So the course objectives are for participants to gain knowledge and some practice in using uh, the Hearts and Minds tools. It's about uh, getting some knowledge and awareness on how to develop and implement a safety culture change program. So where would you start? Uh, you know, what's the situation in your company? What tools might be applicable to your situation? And also an understanding of those additional support resources, how to use them, where to find them also comes up. What's also really important is that uh, not only do you learn about the toolkit and from the facilitator, um, so we have experience, you know, we have a lot of experience using the tools and, if, you know, uh, helping companies with improving safety culture. But people also have always said that they learn from the other participants as well. There's always space to talk with other people and you know you learn what they've encountered, how they've used the tools or how they've improved safety culture. People said we learn as much from each other as we have from the course itself. The structure of the course is uh, three whole day, whole day training sessions. Uh, each session usually includes some interactive work, uh, breakout group exercises, presentations by small teams back to the whole group. The maximum number is usually about 20 and the location is at the Energy Institute in London in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Day one, um, so what we cover is an overview of the course, a background to the Hearts and Minds approach and a thing about leadership and culture. We'll start off with leadership because that's important to consider before you start doing anything to improve culture. In the afternoon, we start. We take you through the toolkit, uh, look at the first of the actual tools, which is making change last. Day two, uh, we always look at the Understand Your Culture tool because we say that's the foundation tool. It's sort of like the one that you probably want to start with in your organizations. And then in the afternoon, look at how you would measure and sustain culture change and some case studies around that, um, which relates to the morning uh, content. Also in the afternoon, we prepare you. So a key part of the training course is that as participants, you get to run a part of one of the workshops on day three. So you're up at the front of the room and actually running not the whole workshop, but a part of the workshop with your uh, with your fellow participants 
to get and get practice and experience of what it feels like to use the tools and run that workshop. So day three, we always get people, as I said, you'll be actually running part of the workshop in the morning and in the afternoon, there's usually a demonstrated run through of uh, a workshop from a tool and that can be guided. You know, that can be sort of a any requests thing as well. So if the group has a specific tool they want to know a bit more about, then we can fit that in in terms of um, you know, having a look at that particular tool, having a quick run through so you can see what's involved with that, uh, allowing, you know, depending on the time available. Course history. So um, we've done this course many, many times now. Uh, the open course has been done between one and two times a year. Uh, we've done that tw more than 12 times with over 200 participants in London. We've also done in-house courses. So this is where a company says, can you come and train some people from our company? So it's just a group from one organization. We've done that probably an equal number of times with you know over 100 participants in many parts of the world. We've also delivered the training online. Um, you know, that was actually inspired, you know. From you know, not provoked, that's the wrong word, isn't it? But um, encouraged by lockdown in terms of delivering the training. Um, so there's many companies that have done the course and we've done the course with people from different companies as well at the Energy Institute. I wouldn't recommend doing trying to do a hybrid one. So that's where you've got some people in a room, some people online. I find that a lot, you know, far too difficult to manage in terms of the communication, the technology. That's that's a difficult one. So I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. And uh, a bit of feedback about the course. So this is some of the quotes from people that we've um, had who've done the training. Uh, I said earlier, you know, we learn as much from each other as we do from the training material. Uh, and that's because you get a range of backgrounds and experience from different industries when you get people together from different organizations. Um, and I'll leave you read those um, quotes from those companies uh, about the course. So just pick out that um, the second one is that people said, people say it gives me the confidence to go ahead and use the tools, which I didn't have before. So I can go ahead and use the tools in my organization. And the third one, I think that's interesting because this was from a logistics company. So this is a delivery company. They said, you know, the tools and the, you know, the, the process of hearts and minds, they said that that will be useful to us as well. And that's quite far away from the, the original industry where it's created in oil and gas. I've actually got Ibrahim uh, in the call um, today who attended the one of the online courses that we did last year. And Ibrahim, just would you like to share a few words about what you got from the course and how you thought it was useful? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Ibrahim Khan. I'm a technical officer at the Energy Institute, and my tenure here actually began with attendance on the Hearts and Minds course. Uh, so for me, the, the real benefit of the course was the practicality. Um, it seems that the course is very careful not to stray too far into the realm of theory if it doesn't serve the purpose of facilitating real outcomes for the attendees. And, um, you know, tying it back to what you said, Matthew, the, the guided run through is a really good example of that because it means that the course derives from the content that is provided, but also the group discussion. So you're not just talking in hypothetical terms, you're talking about insights that are actually relevant to the attendees. Um, something I probably didn't expect going into the course was the scope not just to use the tools but to engage how to engage your organization with the program as well um, so for example how do you get senior leaders in your corner and how does that approach change when you're engaging supervisors how does your organization's makeup affect the way that hearts and minds might be implemented so yeah, I would I would say it's the, the for me it's the understanding of how the research that begins in academia can actually be implemented in in the workplace. Um, so yeah, if you got any questions for me, Matthew, fire away. I'll come back to you at the end. Thank you very much for that insight. That's um, that's that's really valuable. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so finally then, uh, the dates of the course. Uh, so the um. Uh, the next training course will take place uh, in May from Tuesday the 9th to the 11th of May at the Energy Institute in London. 
And if you want to find out how to join that course, then the details are um, on this slide. And you can also contact FAMIDA, the organizer, the organizer of this webinar, uh, if you want to uh, register for the training or if you have any questions, you know, about the logistics of it. OK. So I'll just go to the next slide, which is uh, as we promised at the beginning, uh, there's a Q&A session now. So if you've got any questions about uh, hearts and minds, about the training course, if you've got any questions to Ibrahim, who was a participant on the training, for example, or anything else, then this is the time that we've allowed for that. I've added my um, uh, email as well to this slide, which you'll get uh, after the webinar is finished. There's one final poll that uh, I'd like to launch. So that should be there now. And this is just to get an idea of, you know, what you think would be possible. So I've put um, the question is, which would be your preferred training delivery format? But it's just to get an idea of of those who are, you know, attending this webinar. What would be the most practical way for you um, of actually attending a course. OK, and the preferred way. Interesting. So of the results we got in, it's actually two thirds for face to face, only six so far. But um, that's just to get an idea, because obviously the world's changed um, since lockdown. You know, things have been done online more. Some people like it, some people don't. It's good for some things, not for others, but uh, it's also um, you know, it's just to get an idea of what people might be prepared to do or think it's possible to do. OK. So. Uh, for me, did we get any. Um, questions in the chat that you saw, I'm keeping the poll open so I can't see the chat at the moment. Yeah, we've got one question. Um, are all the tools open access or is there a fee? Oh, could I pass that to Ibrahim for the for the answer to that question? Is that OK? Yeah, sure. So um, the tools, um, they're not open access. There is a fee associated with each tool. Each tool can be purchased independently, um, but the Energy Institute does also provide a company license. So if your organization feels that they might benefit from the toolkit being used across multiple sites, for example, by multiple people. If you're rolling out the initiative on a larger scale, um, you can contact us directly and we can arrange that as well. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, someone asked when the next one will be. Um, so if you can't attend the May course, we are running another one in October. It will be the 17th to the 19th of October. Any other questions there for me, Dad? Um, there is. Can you can you see the chat box? Might uh, be easy for you to read yes, it. if I but right at the bottom. Yes, I need to have to, I have to come out of the polls and go to the chat. Okay. You wrote to the. All oh, right. Yes. Um, that would be part of the training course. So, have you worked out the tangible benefits derived from this program? There's some examples of that in the training course, actually. But that's um. Uh, I'd speak to that then. So it, the payback period, I think it, it's, there's no short answer to that one. You have to be careful how you measure things, what you actually track and monitor, um, but it is possible to do it. And I do have some examples that I share in the training about how you would do that and how it's, um, how people have demonstrated the benefit of working on culture in their organizations. But it varies a lot. You know, it's very different depending on, what the company does and how they how they work. Quick wins for improving safety culture. What do you suggest? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I think. I think it would probably be. Think about what your leadership's doing. And. How they demonstrate their priorities in the organization 
uh, and I think there's some simple things you can do. So if you want very simple things to do that might have a big impact, and this is the idea of a Trojan mouse, so something very small that you put in that has a big impact on the organization rather than the Trojan horse, which is big and obvious. Um, one thing I noticed was in one company, they uh, on their performance contract, they added uh, a line or a question, you know, something that people had to fill in, which was, what are you going to do to, I think it was something along the lines of demonstrate supporting the value, the, the value we have in our company of safety. So what are you going to do for safety this year? And because it was in their performance contract, everyone got very interested in it. So at the beginning of the year, January, February, there was lots and lots of conversations going on about how am I going to put this in my performance contract? What am I going to put in there? How am I going to demonstrate that at the end of the year? And this also helped raise the sort of engagement with safety amongst those people who worked in the uh, not in the front line, so maybe in engineering teams, for example. And that was something very simple to do, but it really got a lot of um, uh, engagement and conversations going around safety. Something else that was relatively simple, um, I was working with a company that was working on improving safety culture, and it was very distributed. So they had lots of small sort of business units, which had monthly meetings, monthly calls. And the managers there changed from asking what's the safety information? So what's the safety data? So how many incidents you've had? How many, um, you know, how many safety observations have you collected? So sort of just looking at the numbers and they started asking, what are you doing to improve your safety culture at the moment? And that changed not only what visibly was their priority, it also changed what the businesses had to report back on. So it helped them actually do things to uh, improve safety culture. Obviously, along with that, they had to provide, you know, you know, the time and, you know, they had to provide support through other means for the business units to actually work on their safety culture. But it's you could do some simple things like that. So there's two examples. Are there any others? Uh, further up in the chat Amita just having a quick look through don't think there are no, there wasn't does anyone else have any questions feel free to just raise your hand and switch your camera on and speak <laughs> oh new messages oh there's something about learning from incidents yeah ah okay so What's the difference between learning from incidents document in Hartsmouth's toolkit and learning from incidents, accidents and events guidance from the AEI? Um, so I believe the difference is um, the guidance document is, uh, you know, is a is a short book I think which describes. Um, how you have an import, a reporting system. It gives guidance on investigations. It gives guidance on, on learning. So it's about what you'd have in place in terms of a system. The Learning from Incidents Hearts and Minds toolkit uh, tool is about how do you engage people with learning? What's going, around, what's going on in terms of the people side, the social side of the organization around that learning process? So I'd say the guidance is more about technical, and the Hearts and Minds tool is more about the um, the social, the people side of how learning occurs in an organisation. I hope that's a quick answer to that question. OK. No more questions? Oh, there's, an, there's another one for you, Matthew. Uh, OK. Oh, um, another 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 thoughtful question from Dominic. Um, if somebody recognizes they're in a pathological culture, how do they move forward? E.g. they are not supported, supported by leadership. Wow, I've never been asked that before. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, without leadership engagement, 
it's going to be very, very difficult to move forward in that culture. But I suppose what you'd have to think about is how do you how would you match up the priorities of those leaders and how it relates to what their company needs to do in terms of safety? Um, I'd have to think about that one actually. Um, it's like you'd have to. How do you get leadership to realise? Hmm. All oh, right. I wonder if that. Uh, so Kirsty has said there's an IOGP report three four three five which covers matching culture level and appropriate tools to get started. Um, I'd be interested to see if it helps at that level of pathological culture as well. Which journey is most difficult on the safety culture ladder? Hmm. I think it's probably. getting fully to proactive. I think that probably takes the most uh, effort. So once the organization realizes that safety is important, to go to reactive from pathological is probably, oh right, yes, this is important. Obviously now, once you get to reactive, you think, well, of course it's important. Getting to calculative takes a lot of work in terms of putting those systems in place, but then changing the mindset to go to proactive and then generative, I'd say that's probably the most difficult one. Thank you for that information, Kirsty. So she said you can download that document from the IOGP website and Patrick Hudson, who was at Leiden University in the Netherlands, uh, he was involved with the Hearts and Minds materials. Yeah, he was the, the lead. Um, uh, he was like the, the, the leader of that project uh, from Leiden University. So thank you, Kirsty, for that. In additional information. Right. So how do you ensure or calculate the effectiveness of the toolkit? I think that relates back to the tangible benefits. That was the earlier question. Um, I think. What and I say this in the training, it's very difficult to relate a broad culture measure with um, safety performance or organizational performance. So you have to look at the activities you put in place, how you specifically try to improve your culture and look at the tangible benefit of those things. That were, you know, those actions which were identified or promoted by looking at safety culture and show the benefit of those specific things, because that's possible to measure and relate to that activity. And that's how you show the benefit. But I'd go more into detail about that in the training course. Thanks, Dominic. Yes, <laughs> Dominic says these aren't tests, but difficult questions, difficult questions asked to me. So really mm -hmm. good getting them. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, they really are. I, I, and I will think about that pathological one. How would you get, a, you know, if you're not supported by your leadership, how do you move forward mm -hmm. in pathological? That's a, I'm going to have to go either way and think about that. So hopefully I'll be able, you know, maybe if you contact me, then uh, uh, when I, when I've, when an answer has occurred to me, which might take a you know a couple of days or so. Mm -hmm. I can get back to you. <laughs> okay. And so, okay. so Kirsty's saying you can email the IGP and ask for that document if you can't get it from the website. Thank you, Kirsty. Okay, it's just gone past eleven, so I think we'll wrap up. Um, so thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Hope you found it useful. Hope you could take something away from it. And thank you again, Matthew, for presenting the webinar today. Thank you, Ibrahim, for joining as well. And thank you all for your questions. So it's really good. Um, the dates for the Hearts and Minds training course are on the slide on your screen at the moment. So um, if you want more information on that, I will be sending around an email after the webinar with um, you know, the video recording, um, links to the web page. And if you have any questions off the back of that, please do feel free to just email me and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, but other than that, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you want to, I'll, I'll keep the um, webinar open for a little bit longer if you have questions. Um, but if not, thank you so much for joining and hopefully we will see you soon. Bye everyone. Thank you.
Thanks all. Bye, thank you.